Rabbi Busco has one of those. Oh, see, because then you get that. <laughs> Just gotta get the right balance. It's all about the balance. Everything is about balance. Life. Well, as in life. Is there a suction cup? Yeah, there is. But, but you don't have it. I do. You have to lick the bottom. Is more. Need to lick the bottom. You have to lick it. <sighs> I'm not gonna lick it. No, I can't go there. there go. We're good. Or Just use don't breathe. Cloth. Okay. All right. And don't drink the water. Testing one, two, three. Okay. Here we go. So we're on page um, 106. Okay. And we're gonna. We did already paragraph 11. We're on really paragraph 12. 12. But I'm just gonna do a little recap. Okay. We're talking about count, taste and see that God is good. We're here. Purpose of creation, God wants to bestow pleasure, not just to save it for the next world. Also in this world was his original intention. A life of Torah, if you taste life of Torah and mitzvahs, should be the most sweetest, delightful, connected, meaningful life ever. However, we don't see that necessarily in the world. So he's explaining why not. Okay, Because the idea here is to live a life of Torah... As we say, the earlier sages said, to live a life of Torah, you have to basically break away your ego. You have to smash your earthly taivas, your earthly lusts and desires, and the way that they did that was the way of Torah. Meaning, to get to the fulfillment of Torah that was called the way, or the derech, darkoshel Torah, which is to sleep on the ground, eat bread with salt, water by measure, live a life of pain and suffering, in order to really break that ego part of ourselves, in order then, and then we can now be in the right mode, in the right zone, to be filling, fulfilling the Torah in the way that it's supposed to be. And of course, all of the secrets of the entire universe are then open to us, because that's really what is in the Torah. The sages, though, of the Talmud were much lenient on that, and they says, now the question is, why did they go lenient, is the question. And I think about that, and I have a few answers, but we won't go into that. But we see 500 years later, after the sages of the Mishnah, 500 years later was the the sages of the Talmud, and they made it easier, and they say the way that, no, a person should always learn Torah, even for not the right motivations. And then through lo lishma, we call it lo lishma, not for the right reasons, he will come eventually to learn Torah for the right reasons, what we call lishma. The goal is Torah Lishma. Okay? Isn't that for the sake of heaven? Is no. God? Good question, and he will get to that answer. It is not for the sake of heaven. Torah Lishma is completely different. I read that somewhere. It's not, for the sake of it's not Lishmo <laughs> for his name. Right. Not Shmo, like he's a Shmo. Like Lishmo means for his name. It's not. Or Lishem Shemayim, for the sake of heaven. It's not that. It's Lishma for its sake. For the Torah's sake. Learning Torah for the Torah's sake. It's like a strange language. Yes, perplexing. What does that mean? So he's going to get to it. Okay? And so the idea here is that when a person engages in learning Torah, even though he does not necessarily have the right, the most purest of intentions when he approaches Torah, he could have ulterior motives. However, we say when a person approaches Torah, just learn Torah, the light that is within the Torah will bring a person to do it for the right reasons. In other words, the Torah has its own ability to elevate the person's consciousness, that he will become an elevated individual and then learn Torah for the right reason. Everybody, that's where we are till now. Okay? So therefore, Le'olam Adam Yilmod Shalolishma even if he learns not for the right reasons, he will come to learn it for the right reasons. Right. Okay? Implying that the light of the Torah will bring him to do it in the right way. However, that's where we are now. One might question the sage's words, however. As in practice, we find that there are certain students who practice, whose practice of the Torah does not help them. Okay, I've got my book. I've got two extra books here, too. How do you like that? Okay? Does not help them. Okay? So we see... So we see that there are people in the world who 
engage in Torah. And we see it doesn't help them. They do not come to merit that the light within the Torah leads them to the transformation for Torah for its own sake. Okay? What's the proof of that? The proof of that is Rabbi Aro, she said it really great. <laughs> I hate to say this, but I'm glad I'm in good company. <laughs> you know, there's this word called from. You ever heard of what from means? Yeah. From means Yiddish for? Devout. Orthodox. Orthodox, religious, right? Mm -hmm. You can't say from, I am from, and smile at the same time. Okay. You can't. You can't, can you? Try. Say, yeah. I'm from. So you just work. did it. <laughs> no, do you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Janet. You're what puzzled. Happened? You look puzzled. What? What happened? Did you read the oh, I um, my, as I was working uh, out, I bleeding? editorial in the yeah. JHV this week? No, but I'll read it. Oh, we'll talk about it later. You share that with me after. Talk about, about the guy who didn't uh, learn, you know, the, the rabbi wrote it. Well, talk, you'll tell me after. It's okay. Hilul Hashem. Well, okay. that's the unfortunate thing, is you'll have a people who will <coughs> dress the look, but they don't mm -hmm. look, they don't act the look. Yeah. yeah. Okay? So that's called a desecration of God's name. But even on a lighter form, you don't have to go so extreme where their actions are just only go against the Torah. But you can even go just to a point where just they're not bubbly people. Okay? I can take you to certain places in the world where you'll see religious people and they're not the bubbliest. Hmm. Maybe. They're bubbly, but not hmm. as bubbly as you would think. If a guy is like... He's in Torah. He's learning Torah. He's connected to God. Mm -hmm. He's got all the mysteries of the universe. His heart, is, his heart, his mind is so open, and he's in such a state of unbelievable enlightenment. You'd think that maybe you'd get a, a smile. <laughs> he'd say, hey, holy brother, how are you today? Oh, holy mm -hmm. sister, how are you today? Yeah. That sounds like Shlomo Kaba. Okay, yes. Well, he's an enlightened person, right? He had a lot of love, right? So in any case, we see that there's people... It seems to be the Torah did not penetrate, if we can go be so bold. All that learning and it, something didn't penetrate their hearts. Okay? The reason is that although the person believes in God and in the Torah, the person believes fully in God in the Torah. And he believes in what's cause and effect. Here he, I, 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 interesting how he translated this as cause and effect. Here the language here is called scharva onish. That means reward and punishment. Okay? Now, we don't look at punishment as God punishes, that he's into punishing, okay? But it is kind of like cause and effect, meaning to the effort that you put in, you're only going to reap the rewards based on the effort that you put in to Torah, okay? That's what we call, or classically it's called reward and punishment, meaning there's consequences of a person's thoughts, words, and actions. There's consequences, okay? So the person might believe in God and the Torah and cause and effect, and he or she practices Torah because God commanded him or her to do so. Nevertheless, they mix their own in self-interest together with the service of God. Okay? So in other words, yeah, I'm into God, I'm into spirituality, but I'm also into myself. Okay? In other words, a lot of people are... You're going to maybe like this one. I don't know. I heard this from Beryl Wine. I wouldn't be able to say it on my own. Some people are rabbis because it's within them to be rabbis. And some people are rabbis by profession. <laughs> okay? Because it's a good paycheck. And they could basically, uh, you know, finagle through and get through it. But yeah. are they really... And they get some ego support from doing So that. the idea here is a person might study Torah and get his ordination because why? So he's called a rabbi. Or there's money in it. Or a person might study Torah so he could be the smart guy in class. Right? Mm -hmm. And knock the rabbi down. How come it says this, rabbi? And right? In the middle of class. It'd be a smart tuchus. There's people like that here. Oh. Not today. <laughs> I didn't want to say the other one. I try to keep this PG rated. Okay? So the idea here is some people are learning and there's many, many, many reasons why a person can learn. Those are the certain reasons that we know that it's brought down. A person wants to become a rabbi. He wants to get glory. He wants to get honor. He wants to get attention. Right? right. Even in his own household, he studies so he can get attention. 
Are those the right reasons? Not so. Okay? So there are people who learn it, but the problem is they learn it, yeah, they believe in God, Torah, they believe in reward and punishment, and they're doing it because it's a mitzvah, but yet, there's a mix. There's a mix of their own self-interest. Okay? Obviously, we're getting a little hint about what Torah Lishma is. Okay? The Torah Lishma has to, is going to be without self-interest. Everything is about that. Everything. Okay? Every single thing in our journey, as long or short as it might be, is about that. Is being able to let go of your self-interest. Are you ready to do that? That's why I say this class is the bomb. Listen it up. If after all the effort, now listen to this question. Listen, as, imagine that this is asked to you. Let's say you've decided from right here and now you're going to put all your energy into Torah and Mitzvahs, all your free time mm -hmm. into Torah and Mitzvahs, right? Let's say after all of your prayers and all your Torah effort, if after all the effort a person puts into the practice of Torah and Mitzvah, Mitzvah, let's say they were going to come and tell you the angels come at the end of a person's life and they say, you know, all of that stuff, you get absolutely no credit for. There's going to be no personal gain from all of your efforts. I got confused. How about the world to come? I'll, let me read it. Let me, I'll read it in the, his writing. If after all the effort the person puts into the practice of Torah Mitzvah, it will become known to him or to her that they would not get any pleasure or personal advantage from their work, then... He or she would regret every bit of effort that was put in it, put in, since the person had deluded himself or herself right from the very beginning into thinking that they would also get personal benefit from their labor. In other words, let's say it became known to you after all your efforts of praying and learning and whatever, it was, it was said to you, by the way, you know, all that you did. Let's say, imagine this, take me, we're, we're doing a walk through. Awake uh, hypnosis uh, exercise meditation. What it was it? it was told to you. Nothing. You you have no personal benefit from this whatsoever. Nothing. What do you mean by personal benefit? Does that mean you don't get to Olam Haba? What is Olam Haba? After okay. Now time. people have are mis people have a certain idea. Of Olam Haba is okay. I worked for you. There's a great story. This guy, he's a rabbi. He worked his tuchas off, right? Can I say tuchas? Yeah. yeah. He worked his tuchas off. And he finally gets into the, into the heavenly court after his life. And he says, I did all of these mitzvahs and all this Torah. He says, you know what they say to him? You were given the opportunity. You should be thankful that you were even given the opportunity to do those things. Well, I think that's mm. what the definition is of personal benefit. Oh, wait a minute. That's, so they let him in. You, we're, we're <laughs> now, we're, at, we're, we're, we're in, we're trying to, we're going to pivot through these waters, okay? You got to try to, got to try to work this out together, okay? Mm -hmm. What is the pleasure of the next world? Being with Hashem. It's not, yes, yes, it's being with Hashem. It's being with God. Yes. So it's not like, I did X mitzvah, I get this reward. I get, I get Y mitzvah, I should be getting this. I should be getting this. Mm -mm -mm. We are developing ourselves to be completely different entities. Doesn't That's this apply the to this world? Doesn't what? This, doesn't this question We're going to work for it. Let's just, I'm work, we're working through this little meditation right now. Okay? I'll, this is going to, this is going to test you. This is testing you. Right now. Because we're really, what we're doing is we're leading you through a gauntlet in terms of where we are headed, okay? No greater joy than being a lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to bust my butt, I'm going to get my pleasures in the next world, get my reward in the next world, okay? It's not that. I'm sorry to bust your bubble. It's not that, okay? We are working on a relationship, okay? Yeah. It's not, you know, people are in relationships, and it's really sad. Right? Where it's like a business deal. Yeah. I do X, Y, Z, you do P, D, Q. Mm -hmm. If I don't do it, right? And, then, and, they're, and they're going ahead and tallying up each other's list. Oh. It's not a relationship. No. It is a relationship, I will agree. But it's not 
the most dynamic of relationships. We're talking about love. Of course. Well, you know, if, if you do all these things and, and you feel good about yourself that day, and you, you wake up at peace in the morning, that's a personal benefit. Okay, you're good. That's good. Now, stick with that. And it's okay to have. The sage just says it's okay. But I'm just going to, I'm just, we're shooting to the end here. Because really what he wants to do is get the goal in mind, and then we're going to work to that goal. The goal in mind is, if you were told, after all of your work in Torah mitzvahs, no personal benefit, how would you feel? Would this person, let's say this person would go, I can't believe it. I worked my whole life. Torah mitzvahs, you know, I could have been a stockbroker or whatever, okay? I could have been on Wall Street. I could have been a doctor, right? I could have made money, and at least I had a big house. Instead, what I did, I sweat, I toil in Torah and mitzvahs, and now I get nothing for it? No well, pers nothing personal? The, pers the person would regret, yes or no? Yes. No. A normal person, let's say, in the way we're coming from, in the mindset that we're coming from, not his mindset, not the Lashma mindset, but a general mindset, a person usually doesn't want to do work where there's got to be no personal benefit. Right. That's the normal trend of human nature. Right. Correct or not? Yes. 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 Okay? So if a person is going to put this practice in Torah and mitzvahs and find out, no credit, no personal credit. Okay? And the person would regret it. You just never should regret a mitzvah. Never regret a mitzvah. Never feel. regret a mitzvah. I don't feel that. A mitzvah is a privilege. Okay, we'll get to it. We'll, we'll understand it. It's like it's a shock, it's a shock question, but it's going to get us to a certain place, okay? This state of mind is called not for its own sake, as it is stated in the Talmud. Do not be like the slaves, the servants, not slaves, servants of Vodim, who serve their master only for the sake of rewards. In the very first chapter of Chapters of the Father, the Ethics from Sinai, Antigonos Ish Soho says, do not be like servants who serve their master in order to receive a reward. Rather, serve your master not for the sake of receiving a reward, which means do it from love. Right. Okay? Don't do it for the sake of getting something out of it. Okay? Well, if you're doing something for the sake of getting something out of it, then that's called Lola Shema. It's permitted. It's okay. Okay? But we just got to understand what does it mean, Lola Shema? Not for its sake. Learning Torah for its sake versus learning Torah not for its sake. Learning Torah not for its sake, right? This is it. The person has some kind of, let me tell you, just cut to the chase right here, okay? Because it's, it's a beautiful thing. Okay, and then we'll answer, we'll ask you a question. Okay. Here it says, Know, Tim, that a person would not get any pleasure or personal advantage. You're not supposed to enjoy studying? You can enjoy studying. Oh. That's what I mean. But you can enjoy personal. meat's vote, too. You can enjoy helping. You can enjoy it. Yeah. But let's say at the end of the day, you got pleasure doing the mitzvah. You got pleasure doing it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay? Because that's an innate thing of your soul. Okay? But let's say... For, the, for, the, for just the record, the way that he's going is, it was told to you even at the end of your life, there was absolutely no, even though you got pleasure at the time and it was a great thing, it was a great do, thing that you did, there's no, it doesn't count as any brownie points in heaven. You don't, I think there's no the bar of gold weight. I it. think the line is, won't get personal advantage. That's what we're talking about, but not necessarily. If it were to become known to him or her that they would not get any pleasure or personal advantage, let me just look at the Hebrew here, okay? It's always better. Any pleasure of a toelis pratis, or personal benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then, and the person, if the person were, would regret it, if you would regret it, then, it, then it's a sign that it's not sure. lishma. It's not for the for its sake. If you would regret it, if you don't regret it, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. If you don't regret it. Hey, there's a guy, they, the, the Gomorrah talks about it, we'll get to it in a second, uh, where the guy uh, gives a, a tzedakah, the Gomorrah in Rosh Hashanah, in the Talmud, a guy gives a, a tzedakah, and he says, I'm giving the tzedakah on the condition that my son will have a healthy life. And they call that a tzaddik gamor. This guy's a fully righteous guy. How's that fully righteous? The guy's doing it on a stipulation? Mm -hmm. What kind of thing is that? He says, mm -hmm. because you know why? If it doesn't happen, he still believes in God. He knows. He's allowed to say it. He's allowed to make a prayer or a stipulation. But, if he, but, but the Jew, 
If, he, if it doesn't happen, he's still okay because he knows God is running the show. He knows there's a God. So he's not toe ala rishonim. He's not astounded on, I made a stipulation. How come I didn't get it? He doesn't regret the mitzvah. Okay? <clears throat> Big thing about regretting mitzvahs. Never regret a mitzvah. Okay? It's, and then we're tested all the time. Okay? So no personal benefit. Okay? <coughs> There's global benefit, I'll tell you right now. The Baal Shem Tov does say, right? When a person does a great mitzvah, a fantastic mitzvah, he prays with um, unbelievable intense concentration. <laughs> right? And he's right, he, and, he, and, 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 and he did it, and it was amazing, and his mitzvah. Like, a person should not take personal credit for it. It was not his eye that did it. It was the bigger eye that did it. Let me get, let me tell you, introduce you. There's a little eye, a lower eye, and then there's the bigger eye. The bigger eye is the global malchut, or the shekhinah, or the divine presence that we're all part of. That's the higher eye. It was the higher eye that enabled you to merit to do it in such a way. Okay? So personally, you don't want to take any lower credit for doing it. The higher eye, you'll give credit to the higher eye, the, the global part that we're all connected because we're all really one soul. The, okay? The unified soul. Okay? The Baal Shem Tov just says, just to cut to the chase, the greatest thing you can do in the world. What's the greatest thing you can do in the world? The greatest thing you can do in the world is to do someone a favor. Hmm. Why? Why? Because they will then thank heaven. It's because, you know, when you do somebody a favor, you don't expect anything back. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to. Just do me a favor. Can you hand me that piano? Or whatever. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, anyways, you know, do me a favor. Can you hand me that pen? Can you just uh, hand, bring this down the hall and give this to this person? And you don't think about it uh, two seconds later after you did it. Right? It's gone. You just did somebody a free gift. And you don't expect anything back. Except unless you're Don Corleone. I might recall a favor. Okay, so you might. So, but normally the greatest thing you can do is to do someone a favor, because you're not expecting it back. And that's the whole thing about the Shema, and that's the whole thing about our existence, as we're going to get to. Okay, we're here to transform ourselves, and the Torah is the vehicle for this transformation. So now we're to go on here. Okay. So nevertheless, the sages permit us to begin working with Torah and mitzvah even when it's not for its own sake on the grounds that working in Torah not for its own sake will lead to Torah for its own sake. In other words, lo lishma, bo lishma. Not for its own sake will take you to for its own sake. However, it is certain that if a person who practices Torah in this way has not merited to believe in God and in his Torah, but is filled with doubt, then the sages were not referring to him or her when they said that the light within the Torah will bring a person back to the good way. Here is the whole pivotal point, okay? So he says here, A person has to, through Torah, even if you're not learning it for the right reasons. He ha you have to have a certain very important intention in mind. It's okay to learn it for your personal benefit. It's okay. You want, but you're, you, uh, you understand that the light of the Torah is going to bring you to a certain level. And the idea here is a person has to work with the intention that what is the Torah supposed to be giving me? People don't even know this. It is so amazing. Do you mean it's Kavana? Yes, Kavana. Direction, focus, intention. What is the Torah? All my learning, all my study, what am I supposed to be getting? What, am I spo what direction am I moving towards? And the idea here is it's one word, it's called emuna, The very first commandment in the Torah. Right. Which some people say it's not really a commandment, but it is to some commentary, co commentaries. What is the first commandment? I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you're going to introduce yourself, you might want to introduce yourself with a more flamboyant kind of statement. I am the Lord your God who made all this. Right? Who made the heavens and the earth. 
Why? Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Hmm? And then, even just a word before that, Ani, Ani Hashem Elokecha. I am Hashem, your Elokecha. It's not Elokechem, yours plural. It's singular. I am Hashem, your God, to each individual who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, basically, why is it not creator of heaven and earth? Is because I'm involved in your specific life. I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm involved in your specific life, every specific detail. So in other words, the idea of the very first commandment, we'll call it, in the Torah, mm-hmm. Emuna, And Emuna, thank God for Rabbi Brody, came this week, gave a great talk. It was terrific. Revamped the whole idea, concept of what Emuna is. Emuna is not faith, I believe. Well, it's just okay. <laughs> it's, it's just okay. But it really means personal connection to God. You know, I bought his book and I read it this morning. This is just right on target with your talk. Today. Perfect. Which book? Hashem. Which book? Amuna. So, the Garden of Amuna? No. It's a book he wrote he wrote. some small ones that he was selling. They might, they might still be at the Torch Center. Personal the- faith, Amuna, means personal connection to God. Okay? That's what Amuna means. In other words, every single about thing about Torah, when you approach Torah, even if you're approaching it for not for the right reasons, you have to have this, whatever you call it, wet tool, or this intention in mind, that you have to reach a level of greater faith in God. Connection to God. It's about being connected. Personally connected. Okay? So that's what he says here. Nevertheless, going on back in that paragraph, nevertheless, the sages permitted us to begin working with Torah and mitzvahs, even when it's not for its own sake, on the grounds that working in Torah, not for its own sake, will lead to Torah for its own sake. Just, however, this is what I wanted to get to, it is certain that if a person who practices Torah in this way has not merited to believe in God and His Torah, if he didn't get any stronger in his amuna, okay, but it still has doubts. That's Amalek. Amalek is mm-hmm. the same numerical value as doubt. Well, I didn't know that. He still has doubts. Is Hashem with me or not? Oh, man. Then the sages were not referring to him or her when they said that the light within the Torah will bring a person back to the good way. In other words, if you don't have a Muna, or you're not working on a Muna, or trying to work through that, right? Through all of your Torah study, then then this whole rule does not apply of I can learn Torah and the light in the Torah is going to elevate me. It's not going to do bupkis. Does everybody know what the word yeah. bupkis means? Yeah, sort of. yes. okay, I'm not going to say what it means. It's a bupkis <laughs> ball. These are little balls that grow in the trees that they would throw at each other on Tisha B'Av. Well, I know people who don't believe in Hashem at all. They think there isn't any. But they nevertheless behave the way one should, even to the extent of keeping kosher, because it's the right thing to do. Okay, so that's the right thing to do. How alive are they? How happy are they? How joyous are they? No, Smiling all the time? Always with a good greeting? Okay. For the light which is <laughs> for the light which is in the Torah, for the light which is in Torah only shines forth for those who believe that it does so. I underline this. Mm-hmm. Okay? In other words, here you have to understand the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. The red pill, you got to believe in the red pill. The red pill is going to wake you up. Okay? You got to believe that the light in the Torah is going to bring you to the right relationship with God, the right connection. Not only that, but the measure of the strength of the light of the Torah directly accords with the degree of a person's belief. Mm-hmm. And this is a Muna. In other words, if you have a Muna and you're working on a Muna, and that's like the biggest thing to work on now, is your Muna, your personal connection to God. But for those who lack this faith, the reverse happens. The reverse happens. For those who use it wrongly, the Torah becomes a drug of death. What does that mean? Uh-oh. I could take you on a tour of certain neighborhoods. Mm. Uh-oh. I don't want... Oh, this is going live, baby. I'm going to be in trouble now. <laughs> just They're going to come after me. Uh-oh. The zombies are going to no, come no, after no. me. 
Don't say what neighborhood, and you'll be okay. You go, Shalom, hi. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> A drug of death. Are they happy? Are they vibrant? Are they alive? Are they happy? You're, oh, wow, hey, you're Jewish? Hey, I, where do you come from? Hi. Okay. <laughs> A drug of death. They're not, it doesn't somehow, they're, I don't know, they're so caught up in their, I don't know what they're caught up in. They're just dulled. I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I know people, a lot of people have answers. We all have, can say answers. I'm just saying a person can learn and learn and learn and they become an unbelievable scholar and they can know every single passage of the Talmud including Gomor Rashi Tosos and all the Psukim and everything and he could be an unbelievable Darshan but he's still a driest. Chamor no says for him, he's a mule that carries books. Okay, book knowledge, don't cut it. Okay? Book knowledge doesn't cut it. It's what you do with it. It's how it does it elevate you. How's your personal connection to God? Are you, you should be dancing down the streets. You should be dancing up and down, may assuring. Some of them are. Okay? For those who use it wrongly, it becomes, in other words, they want to become a rabbi, they want to be head, head, head of a, a synagogue, they want to, they learn the Torah, to become this, to become that, to become a smart aleck, and somehow, something's missing in their lives. Yeah. For they receive darkness from the Torah when their eyes are dimmed. The sages created an apt parable to explain the biblical statement. You want the day of God, this is Amos. Why do you want the day of God? Why... Is it the day of God for you? For you, it is darkness and not light. What? Who is he talking to? Aha. So here it is. This is analogous to a rooster and a bat. The rooster and the bat. The parable of the rooster and the bat. Have a conversation. Both of whom are waiting for the dawn. The rooster says, I'm waiting for the light as it is my light. It's the, my day. What do you want the light for, Mr. Bat, besides coronavirus? Okay. <laughs> what do you want the light for? The analogy here is exact. From it, we can, deep, we can clearly understand that those who study but do not progress from the stage of practicing Torah not for it, to the stage of practicing Torah for its own sake. In other words, they don't reach that level. Why don't they get to there? Why didn't the light of the Torah penetrate and make them two elevated beings? How come it didn't work? It is because of their lack of faith that they do not receive any light from the Torah. It's because they didn't work, not understand that the purpose of the Torah is to get us to Emuna. It's to, put, it's to enhance our relationship with God. It's all about that. You know, in the biblical days, way down, way when they were in the desert, you know, their day, how they they went, they would have the, the public read together in their little groups, thousands of groups. They would go through what the scroll says. They argue about it. They debate. They get into the de details. They have a big discussion about it, right? Read one verse at a time, and then they go out the rest of the day. They go out into the mountains and the hills, and they would go and integrate it, and they would pray to God based on what they learned to integrate it. It's all about integrating. It's got to get here, right? It's got to be, what's the deeper meaning? And each mitzvah significant meaning in the soul about the soul okay about how to relate to god it's a it's it you know even though they can seem like external kind of mitzvahs at the at the outright like the the, at the red heifer what is a red heifer you burn this head you got to sprinkle it on somebody oh there's deep meanings in all of it mm. and they were totally attuned to those deep meanings that's why the study of kabbalah and this is really where he's going to he's going to say you know I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> if you've been studying Talmud for years and you didn't get enriched in Amuna, then you got to change your track. Okay? So a lot of people can study Talmud their entire lives and it has not enriched Amuna one bit. So then, and there's chazals or statements that we have from our sages who have banged down and saying, you got to change your direction. So his advice is, you got to go into the study of mysticism because the soul and has a direct connection to God. So you got to go direct. You can talk about a cow, one cow, 
goring another cow and all the intricacies of this cow gores this cow and how many times cow, cow is it and how much is the cow worth and you could do that and it's great stuff it's great stuff it is it's all oh, it's amazing and there's a lot of depth to that too some of the greatest mysteries but on the surface I don't have a cow and uh, okay I have a dog, right it could be a dog you know it could attack any of them okay but you know Where's God in that? I'm telling him, serious. There's one huge rabbi. He asked, like, this whole group of men. He says, go here. All your sons are studying in yeshiva. No, okay. Go home. When was the last time that they thought about Hashem? And I think one guy came back. One, no, none of them in months. Because they're, they're into very big, big, huge details in the Talmud. Studying very intricate laws. They don't talk about God. Okay? Mm one of those things. It's, this is said a lot. It's not just me saying it, okay? And that's why he's going to say people have to study mysticism more because they have to become familiar with the connection to God. Because if you're, if you're learning Torah and you're not getting enriched with Imuna, you got you got to change your track. Okay. So, let's go back here to that line here. It is because... Okay, so, so we can clearly understand... Those who study but not do not progress from the stage of practicing Torah not for its own sake to the stage of practicing Torah for its own sake, it is because of their lack of faith that they do not receive any light from the Torah they nurture their amuna. They walk in darkness and will die without wisdom. Hmm. Very serious. A drug of death. The Torah can be a drug of death. But the those who have the merit of complete faith, can be sure that the practice of Torah and Mitzvahs, even when undertaken not for its own sake, will shine its light upon them and will reform them and they will even merit to practice Torah for its own sake without going through prior afflictions and a life of suffering. In other words, we don't have to sit on the, sleep on the ground anymore and eat <clears throat> bread with salt, okay? The light in the Torah, if we approach it with the right attitude, it will... It will enhance us and will elevate our consciousness. Practicing Torah for its own sake will bring them a life of happiness and good, both in this world and the world to come. Yes, it is for the purpose of this world. God does want you to have the most unbelievable dynamic relationship right here and right now. It's not, no, I've got it saved for you in the next world. Suffer now, suffer. Okay? Like some people do want to say. Okay? No, 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 no. Pleasantness, connection, mm -hmm. just love, just love. About such a person it is written, Then you shall delight in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you the inheritance of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Prophet Isaiah. Okay? Okay. All right? See, we're meant to be, you know, I wrote here a little note. You guys can't probably can't read it in my photocopies. But, you know, there was a golden era that we did have. That was in the time of King Solomon, the early days of King Solomon. It was called the golden era of Judaism. Every night was a full moon. Don't ask me how. That's pretty good. But you can admit, but the but the, but the golden era of Judaism, which was we finally that we were doing what we were supposed to, do, we were functioning in the world as we were supposed to function. We relied unto the nations. We didn't have to go all the way out to Cucamonga to go ahead and give a class, but they would come to us, right? You know where Rancho Cucamonga is. Okay, so they didn't have to go to Cucamonga. Okay, but. Everybody saw the Jewish people and everybody appreciated the Jewish people. They appreciated what we had to offer to the world. Don't forget any problem. Don't forget while King Solomon was in reign, there were no calamities in the entire earth. Not one sickness, no viruses, no hurricanes, no earthquakes, no floods, no nothing. Right? It's pretty good, mm -hmm. right? And he had the solutions to every single problem, no matter what county, country, or state, or you were in. He says, you have to work this, 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 A, B, C, D. They did it. They followed his advice, and boom, boom, boom. Pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. Solve the world's problems. Pretty good. Golden era, okay? 
Everybody can come and see the divine presence and have a divine experience. You just go to the temple, right? That was the vortex, right? You just go there and you always get a complete mystical experience. And then you go back home to L.A. or wherever. And people would go, you are in Jerusalem, tell me all about it. And they would just feel your aura, okay? And they would get enlightened, just like you could talk and you're like, well, unbelievable. Okay? That's what the life was like. We were meant to be like that in this world. It's meant to be. It's meant to be. Okay? We're meant to be where people will see you and go, yeah, I want to be like that. I want to live like that. Yeah. But if you got a guy who's like, <laughs> yeah, I want to be like that. Wear black all day in 180 degree weather. Okay? Black wool. Okay? <laughs> Something. Need a few more red pills. George! George! We need a bucket of red pills. Okay? Okay, in any case, paragraph 14, okay? In a similar fashion, I once explained the proverb of the sages, okay? And the proverb goes like this, okay? Mi shetoraso umanuso. Somebody whose Torah is his craft. That's how they translate it as craft, umanuso. It's a very interesting word, umanuso. You probably already picked it up a little bit because it's the exact same words of emuna. Okay? When you say a craft, and it kind of makes sense now that we have Rabbi Brody's definition of emuna, emunaso, is a Torah is his craft. A craft is somebody where, a guy who's a craftsman, right? And he knows how to, I don't know, carve wood, or make things out of metal, or whatever it is, right? And he's really good with it, and he's been doing it for a long time, he's very expert, he almost doesn't have to think when he's doing it, right? right? It's almost like second nature. It's easy, it comes easy, it's a craft, right? So Imuna, obviously, when you talk about connection, connection to God, is that your craft, mm -hmm. okay? Is that the craft? Are you habitual, mm -hmm. okay? So it says here, I once explained the proverb of the sages, he whose Torah is his craft. According to the way a person practices Torah, here's got another bomb for you guys, okay? According to the way a person practices Torah, so can the measure of his or her faith be known. Look at this, I was going to bring this down. Okay, because the Hebrew word for amana, craft, has the same letters as the Hebrew word for emuna, faith. A man has a certain measure of faith in his friend, and he lends him some money. He may believe in him to the extent of loaning his friend a dollar, but if his friend would ask for two dollars, uh, no. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm not that close. Okay. He would refuse to lend it to him. Maybe he has faith in his friend to the extent of a hundred dollars, but no more than that. Hi, can you loan me a million? Uh, I don't think so. Or it is possible, maybe it's possible, go work with me folks here on this. Or is it possible that he may have faith in his friend to the extent that he is willing to loan him up to half his property, but not all of it? It is possible too that he might have so much faith in his friend that we loan him everything he owns without any shadow of fear. Take every single thing I own totally. Totally. I have total trust in you. Okay? So you see there's different levels of faith that you can relate to with people that we come in contact with. How much will you loan this person if you need to? Could you loan him everything? Okay. Okay? This last example of faith is what's considered to be complete faith. So let's think about it now. Mm -hmm. That's in terms of between man to man. Mm -hmm. You can look at how much do you trust another person. And you can look at it in terms of money or anything else for that matter. Will you loan somebody your car? <laughs> right? To bands. If it's my old jalopy, my third car, yeah, go ahead, take it. <laughs> but if it's my Lexus or my, what, a Tesla. You know. Come on, I need your Tesla. I'm, you know, I'm going on a date tonight. I need your Tesla. I don't think of so. <laughs> Right, even though you've got your little, you know, Toyota Corolla, right? 1962 Toyota Corolla in the garage. Okay. The last example of faith is considered to be complete faith. We call it Shlema. Emuna Shlema. The previous modes are counted as partial faith. 
bilti shlema. Okay, they're less. So now you have an idea of what is complete faith. You have a concept of what is not complete faith. So, one person, for example, may budget for themselves according to the measure of his or her faith in God. Now let's take that example, that paradigm, and use it in terms of how much do we believe in God? How much faith do we have in God? How much time of day are you going to give in terms of your relationship with God? So one person, for example, may budget for themselves according to the measure of his or her faith in God. One hour of the day to practice Torah and spiritual work. Spiritual work. I love how he puts it that. Let me just see the Hebrew here. Okay. Right? Okay, one second, let me skip ahead. He calls it a voda here. Okay? Service of God, spiritual work. Spiritual work. So, okay, I'm willing, I'll trust God to the point, well, I'll, okay, I'll give him an hour. I'll give him an hour. Another may assign two hours of the day to this work, according to the measure of his or her faith in God. A third does not let a single moment of his or her free time pass without practicing Torah and spiritual work. Every single moment is spiritual work. Am I working on my spirituality every free moment? The problem is, what happens if a person decides, I have no free moments? I'm busy all day, Rabbi. Rabbi, does it count as spiritual work if you are doing something and having in mind the ethical and spiritual way? Absolutely, we learned that yesterday. We learned it in the Beit uh, in the um, I give a class in Beit Rambam on Saturday so afternoon. So you could be doing something totally mundane, let me, but let me, you have an attitude. There's an amazing thing. It says like warm yourself by the light of the sages. Don't watch out to be burned by it, and. Um, um, I forgot because the, the, the sages are like coals right the sages words are like coals what do you mean the sages words are like coals like a coal could sit there and you don't know if it's hot or not so you grab it right but it could look like there's no fire within it right mm -hmm. so a person could learn can let's say look at the sages and look at the rabbis look at the sages what they're doing and when they're involved in the praying, a person is enlightened, it's mochin de gadlut, right? It's an enlightened kind of state, or even they're learning or giving a drudge or talk, okay, that's enlightenment, that's gadlus, we call that mature intellect. But when they're involved in mundane matters, they're taking out the garbage, they're washing the dishes, they're sweeping the floor, yeah. mundane activity, mundane activity. So the person might learn from the rabbi, he said, okay, I guess you could do mundane activity. There was this once this yeshiva bachar, right? Star yeshiva student, student, right? Got married, and he had a problem with him and his wife. They came in to see the Rosh Yeshiva, and the wife was saying, you know, he, he uh, you know, or he said, I, you know, he felt it was beneath his dignity to take out the garbage, and his wife should take out the garbage. The rabbi says, don't worry, we'll, 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 take, we'll take care of it. You go home, and you'll be okay. The next morning, the Rosh Hashiva, the rabbi, came, knocked on the door at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he took the garbage out right in front of the guy. Ooh, how you feeling now? Okay. <laughs> in any case, right? The guy learns his lesson. Rabbis can do mundane things. But the thing is, in those mundane things, don't think it's just an external kind of activity that the rabbi has to stop his spiritual enlightened stage and engage in. Within that are the highest of the highs. In other words, you could take those mundane activities, and that's what the sages always did, and they elevated it to the most spiritual things. Mm -hmm. Mundane activities become unbelievable. You think it's a coal, but there's a fire within it. There's deeper things within the words and the actions of the sages. Okay, and the biggest example is Hanukh. You know about Hanukh in the in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Hanukh didn't die; he beamed up. They beamed him up, right? He dematerialized. God took him, right, while he was alive, and he became 
the head of the CEO mm-hmm. of the world of Yitzir, of the dimension of Yitzir, called Matat. Do I say Matat for short? I don't want to say his whole name. The yeah. archangel of the entire world of Yitzir. And the, and the Baal Shem Tov brought down, you know what he did? You know what his activity was? He was a shoemaker. Shoemaker? And that guy became that because every stitch in the shoe when he was making those shoes, right? The satellite camera would be on him and they would see just guy stitching. His mind would say, I am now connecting the earth to the heaven. But with every stitch, he was now bonding the lower realms to the higher realms with every stitch. So his whole mind was focused on a, in a, in a micro way, he was thinking macro. He was now binding the entire earth to heaven, to the spiritual. So he got the job. Okay? So the idea here is in the mundane activities can be, we can and we must turn them into mitzvahs, turn them into dynamic uh, effects that we're actually affecting in the cosmic realm. Okay, let's just finish this paragraph. The idea here is it really smacks us in the face. I'm sorry to be a, this like, kind of like smack job, okay? Because it's like, where's your emuna? Okay? A third, the third, third person does not let a single moment of his or her free time pass without practicing torn spiritual work. Only in this third example do we see someone whose faith is complete. That's Emunah Shlema. He or she believes in God to the extent of their whole property, my whole day, my whole life for you. Can you say that with absolute conviction? Yeah. My whole life for you. I trust you so much. Okay, we're working there. Okay, we're on, we're on the path. Okay. This is not true of people in the previous examples whose faith is built Shlema, is not complete. We need not labor at this point. He doesn't want to go anymore. Okay? So the idea here is, okay, we're working on him. We're working to reach our level of consciousness where we can absolutely say with 100% conviction, my whole life for you. I trust you totally with every single moment. And you know something? I And you know, this is the, as I read this, I'm thinking about that's the... Thing that's called mindfulness that people are mm-hmm. involved in, right? It came from me. We go, hey, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. We've been involved in this for thousands of years. The whole tour is about mindfulness. It's about when you're doing a mundane activity, right? To be focused on it when you're taking out the garbage, you are now cleansing the world of all its sins. As a matter of fact, the Vilna Gon says when you're going to the bathroom, okay? Mm-hmm. Not really allowed to think Torah thoughts. Right, but you can now have in mind you are now shedding all of your negativity and all of your bad meters, your bad character traits. As a matter of fact, that's what he says. Unbelievable, right? Huge kabbalistic thing of going to the bathroom in the morning before davening. Huge, huge. Okay, <laughs> okay. So the idea here is two major points. Okay, just a recap. Okay, we're heading towards lishma. But this Lishma part, to learn Torah Lishma, needs a certain uh, stipulation that a person is approaching, even though he's not learning for their ultimate pure motives, he's allowed, but you have to have the one motive that I am aware that the light of the Torah is going to bring me to the right place of consciousness. Okay? You have to have in mind. In other words, emuna, connection. Okay? And the other thing is, okay, we might, how much on a level of emuna are you? An hour a day, halavai, you sit with God and discuss over a cup of coffee every now and then. Okay? Discuss your day. How's your life going with, over a, with, with a cup of coffee? Right? Give them five minutes, right? Halavai, you give them five minutes. Right? But imagine now you're in the state of complete and total faith, and all of us, it is within us, it is there. You have to know it's there. To have that unbelievable emuna and faith and trust in God where you're willing to every single thing. My whole life. That's why we, we say every single day, Love Hashem your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, all your might means all your money. Because you trust God implicitly because He is the ultimate source of everything for everybody. Okay. 
Go out to your weeks. Okay? Today I am closer to learning Torah Lishma. Thank you, Hashem. Okay? 